Well, good evening, everybody. We are talking to Wednesday Night Bible Study, <clears throat> where we are continuing through our journey through the book of Revelation. I have been your host <laughs> for the past, this will be week number three, and I will be your final host for week number four next week. Um, we will continue through our journey tonight. Um, I pray everyone had a great week. Sound is very low, George says. You sound low. Do I sound low, George? A bonus week. No, it's only four. It's only four. Well, I haven't seen anything else. Has it? <laughs> But we are going to continue our journey tonight. We're going to be covering Revelation chapter 7 and a little bit of chapter 8. Um, so let us open up with a word of prayer and we will maximize our time together and be edified in Christ. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Father God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You've given us the daily bread of your word. You've given us the daily bread um, of Jesus himself. Uh, living the life that we were supposed to live and dying the death that we were condemned to die. Giving us the eternal promise that you would never leave us nor forsake us. That you would continually be with us in the midst of good times, in the midst of bad times, Father. Uh, we ask that you be with us in the midst of tonight's discussion, tonight's Bible study, Father God. Uh, let me decrease and only let you increase and let this all be about you, Father. Let us have a good understanding of what it meant for them and how we can apply this <clears throat> to our lives today as well, Father. So we ask that you just be in the midst of this discussion. Let everything be glorifying to you. Let us be edified in you. And let us grow with one another as well. And we submit this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So we are continuing in the book of Revelation. Last time we left off, we left off at seal number six in the sealed scroll. So let's do a open book test. Your answers are going to be coming from Revelation chapter six. So your first question is, what was seal number one? What was the first seal? White horse. Number two, what was the second seal? Red horse. See, this is easy. Open book. Number three, what was the third seal? Black horse. All right. Number four, what was the rider's name of the pale horse? Death. Death. All right. See, y'all have to pay attention. All right, number six. Who was under the altar in the fifth seal? Those those who have been slain for the word of God, martyrs, those that were persecuted, those that died. And the last question we'll leave off here, question number six. What is the sixth seal all about? What is the sixth seal all about? Destruction of the world. Destruction. Judgment. <laughs> Leading up. All right, so as we got the good test. Everybody passed. Congratulations. You can write a hundred and put a little check mark on this section for chapter six. 
We want to go to our basic understanding, and as we've been going through, revelation is just an act of revealing or communicating divine truth by God to man. Here's your extra credit question. Who is being revealed in the book of Revelation? Jesus. Jesus. Everybody gets that extra point. So our agenda, as I said, I've been your host for the past couple weeks. Genesis is the prologue. Revelation is the epilogue. Revelation, we are going to get some views of what has happened before. We're going to be understanding cultural context, what it means for the first century believers, and how it applies to us as well. We're going to see a lot of similarities and contrasts. We're also going to see kingdom, tabernacle, and temple within the book of Revelation. And also, we are going to ask questions of the text. Ask questions of the text. So our overview and themes is that we, this book, Revelation, apocalyptic literature, uses signs and symbols, but it also is to encourage persecuted followers of Christ, those in the first century, those today as well. It reveals God's cosmic rule, how God is sovereign on the throne and in control of all things. It shows Jesus' role as the lion, as the lamb, and as we will possibly see tonight, the shepherd. We see a complete defeat of evil. Even though we're living in evil times right now, we look forward. This book is about hope, where evil will be completely defeated, and we will be away from the presence of evil. And last but not least, God's kingdom fully revealed. As it was in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, everything was peaceful for the first two chapters. Chapter three rules out the window, all chaos. So to start us off tonight, I have asked Pastor Harris to read for us Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 through 29. You're going to want to mark your Bibles in this section because we're going to be going back and forth through this book as we go through certain sections in Revelation chapter 7. So I turn it over to you, Pastor Harris, Exodus chapter 14. All right, so Exodus, uh, I'll start Fourteen, thirteen, and it reads the ESV. Moses said to the people, "Do not stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent." The Lord said to Moses, "Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it." People of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, but I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. The people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariots' wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea. The water may come back. 
upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned, covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, none of, not one of them remained. The people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall for them on their right hand and on their left. What do we see going on in this passage? What do we see going on in this passage? God's protection, God making a way, God hardening the heart, God destroying the enemy, yep. God. <laughs> it, all work. it sounds like God is in control of this whole situation. As we talked about last week, God allows things to take place. God allows persecution to take place. And we also see also the fact that the Egyptians aren't fearful. Exactly. You know, they continue to pursue. Mm. They continue to pursue in the midst of all of this. They want their property back. I'm not just talking about the gold that the Israelites mm. plundered from them. They want the people back. Mm. They are desperate and will do anything. Egyptian Empire sounds similar to the Roman Empire a little bit. All right, but God in control, God allows all these things to take place. As we're going to see even more, God is allowing all this, but there is a purpose for it. And as our brother AJ said, he do, you do see protection in there. In the midst of all this chaos, you do see protection. But you're also going to see judgment at the same time. And also, one of the things we sometimes we struggle with is that God hardened their hearts. So, yeah, God, God was like, okay, he, 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 that's one of his judgments upon them, is to harden their heart. In other words, just kind of let the heart go away it wanted to go in the beginning with, right? And without any grace upon them to, for them to repent. So, you know, get the, no restraint, no restraint. So, as we go through Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Elder Jones, can you read that for us? Uh, I left the elder at home. Can I still read? <laughs> you can still read. <laughs> so you won't get fined. Yeah. <laughs> After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the land, on the sea, or on any tree. I saw another angel coming up from the east with a seal from the living God. And he shouted to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. I heard how many were sealed, 144,000 from every tribe of the people of Israel. All right. As you can tell, I have a few things highlighted on the screen. Well, not highlighted, but in color. So let's start with the basics, the four angels, and another angel. Angel really means messenger, okay? We're just going to go very basic, very surface. Angel means messenger. Angels deliver messages for God. If you look in the book of Daniel, if you look at, if you were pregnant back in the old days, if you were barren and you were about to give birth to a child, most likely you'd be visited by an angel. Ask Elizabeth, ask Mary. You can even go to Sarai. But that was the angel of the Lord. Where are these angels at? I gave you one of the answers. Four corners. Four corners. Of the earth. They remember what four means? Four corners of the earth. Completeness on earth. The whole earth. Doesn't mean the earth is a square. That's right. <laughs> Doesn't mean that it's a square. 
If we think in cardinal directions, north, <laughs> south, east, west. <laughs> what are they doing? I gave you the next answer. Holding back the four winds. Where are the four winds coming from? North, south, east, west, cardinal directions. They were given power to harm the land and the seas. Now, God created everything. He spoke everything to existence. Land, sea, air. These angels are now given power. These messengers are given power to be able to destroy what God created. What were they told to do? Wait. Time out. Wait. <laughs> Who else was told to wait? Another extra credit question from chapter 6. Who else was told to wait? The martyrs were told to wait. Who were they told to wait by? These four angels. They were told to wait by somebody. So my question is, who is this other angel? Who is this other angel? Is it Jesus? Me? <laughs> it's one of those I want you to kind of sit with it for a minute. It's kind of one of those things we read over. It's like we got the four angels and another angel appears. And he's the one that gives this command, wait. Could be an archangel. Gabriel, Michael. We don't know things. Exactly. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Go ahead. Somebody in line trying to say something? I think that was not in the background. Background. We don't know. There are many theories of who we could be, but we don't know. But that's a question for another time. The winds. When we think of wind, it's something that we can't see, but we can feel it. In their mind, the wind would be the breath of God or the spirit. The way we get that is if you read Genesis 1-2, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Same word for wind. But then, if you go farther in, it's the same exact word. Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord formed the man out of the dust from the ground, and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living soul. So when we think of wind, when they thought of wind, most likely they'd be thinking of the breath of God. Now, when you see the breath of God, you see the breath of God here as creation. Breath giving life, breath giving goodness, breath giving purpose. All of a sudden, as we're reading the passage, it's talking about a wind coming to harm and destroy the earth. So this breath seems a little bit different. This wind seems a little different. You had your hand raised? Uh, no, no. Okay. That's my problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how we get it into the proper context. Put the wind and the east together. East normally represents judgment and protection. Just as Elder AJ was talking about, as you looked in the passage in Exodus, where did the wind come from? The east. Strong east wind. It shows protection for the Israelites crossing through, 
because it makes a way as the waters are now parted, but it also brings the Egyptians to their watery grave as it brings judgment. Even before that, when you look at the fall of man, Genesis 3, 24, he drove the man out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. Every time you see east in the scriptures, it always points to judgment and protection. Always points to judgment and protection. This is Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the garden. What direction did they get kicked out? East. Also, you see a lot. A lot goes east of Sodom and Gomorrah. East situates themselves there, which was bad. <laughs> exactly. If you want to go even further, you can go not another chapter. Cain and Abel. After Cain kills his brother Abel, he goes east to the land of Nod. Judgment always starts heading east. But whenever you see it, you do see protection and judgment at the same time. Because with Adam and Eve, judgment came after they sinned. They were kicked out of the garden, but they were protected at the same time. They were protected from going back into the garden and taking from the tree of life. So when the first century believers would be hearing this passage, they'd be hearing about judgment coming, but they'd be seeing their protection as well in the midst of this judgment. The sealed servants. Seal. Represents security. Represents ownership represents something that's important. What are we talking about? We're talking about a sealed scroll. The scroll is sealed and only one person can open it. The lion and the lamb have won the right to open this scroll and remove the seals. But it's also a guarantee at the same time. So when it talks about sealing servant, how are these servants sealed? Who are they sealed by? To make it an even easier question, who are we sealed by? Sealed by Jesus, sealed by his guarantee, which is the Holy Spirit, indwelling believers. That's a mark. The Holy Spirit is our mark that we belong, that we have a purpose, that we belong to God that God finds us important enough to seal us. And because of that, we are now secure. We have a guarantee that we will be with him. So even in the midst of persecution, he gives us a seal to let us know I'm with you. Remember, this book of Revelation is about hope. You're going to be seeing a lot of hope in this chapter, in chapter 7. As we continue on, Miss Phoebe, I put I spelled your name up there right all the way through. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Judah were sealed. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Reuben. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Gad. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Asher. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Naphtali. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Manasseh. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Simeon. Twelve thousand from the tribe of Levi. 12,000 from the tribe of Ishkar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Are those hard names? No, no, no. You did very well. <laughs> All right. I can almost spell them as you say. <laughs> All right. Know if this is going to work. Well, all right. Who did their homework? Tim, I need you in here now. 
Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Who did their homework? All right. I did it. So the homework was to find two passages that dealt with the number 12. I gave you one for free in Exodus. Whoever Y is, oh, you put a whole bunch of them up there. I like that. I don't know. But I like it. I was told to ask who is Y. It's Marlene. Uh, <laughs> all right. So we got a few. Genesis 17 20. Ishmael had 12 princes. Number 784. 12 bowls, 12 plates, 12 dishes. Numbers. All right. Pastor Harris, I saw your hand raised. Go ahead. What do you have? Uh, it was just a border point, but uh, <laughs> and uh, and when he entered this house, he took a knife and took a hold of his concubine. He divided her limb by limb into twelve pieces <laughs> throughout all the territory of Israel. Mm. <laughs> hold that passage. Hold that passage. <laughs> right, Sister Barbara. Uh, anyone? Anyone? Uh, Solomon appointed 12 governors. Um, this is 1 Kings uh, 4 and 7. Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each man had to make provision for one month in the year. Mm, I like that one. Hold on to that one. We got 12 cakes. Shalom, brother. Shalom. <laughs> 12 cakes placed in the tabernacle. That was Leviticus. Ooh. 24, 35. You had uh, 12 spies that scouted out the promised land. Wow. Uh, and Jacob had 12 sons. And then 12 tribes of Israel. And you got 12 plates, 12 bowls, 12 bowls. It's in numbers. And. Um, well, it was there was one in, I got messed up. I got one in in uh, the New Testament, but you want the Old Testament. I'll let you get a pass. No, well, I want to hear the one in the New Testament. When Jesus, Jesus spoke in the uh, in the temple, he was twelve. Twelve years old. I like that one. You get that one. You get that. One. You get extra credit for that. You get extra credit for that one. Uh, Sister Tammy put Joshua four eight. 12 stones after they crossed from the Jordan. Ezekiel 47, 13, divide the land per 12 tribes. Hmm. Number 12 seems very important. Does anybody know what 12 represents? Perfection and authority. Completion, perfection, authority. Okay. Number 12, we're going to build on to what you said. Also, the people of God. Relationship within the people of God. The 12 tribes of Israel. When you talk about King Solomon, Sister Barbara, can you repeat that one one more time about King Solomon and appointing the 12 elders or 12 elders? Solomon had 12 officers, excuse me, over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each man had to make provision for one month in the year. That's 1 Kings 4 and 7. Perfect. King Solomon had slaves. King Solomon used the 12 tribes of Israel who are over all of Israel, God's chosen people, to serve his needs. Judges, what was yours, Pastor? <laughs> yeah, I said I was the warning, so they cut the <laughs> I divide up the 12 pieces so 
so they could go out to all the territory of Israel. All the territories of Israel. Twelve tribes of Israel. Judgment is coming. <laughs> this is a warning. This is what might happen to you and could happen to you and will happen to you. But when we think of 12, completeness is there. People of God is there. Community is there. It's so many nuanced definitions that are all encompassed in 12. When we get to the number 1,000, here we see many, absolute, and completeness. So let's put 12,000 together. By definition, what would it be? 12,000. 12 times 1,000. The many, absolute, complete community of the people of God. 12,000. All right? Now we go to 144,000. So 12 times that 12,000. Each and every one of God's people in his chosen community is present. That's the easiest way to look at it. Everyone that is in God's chosen community, God's people, is present. No one is missing. No one is left out. You have the four corners of the earth. Who's escaping judgment? You have 144,000 in the presence of God. Who's, who's, around, who's not around? Everybody's there. All of God's chosen people are there. All the ones that are going to experience judgment are there. This is a play on how John is looking at things and how it's being revealed that God is in control of all. If you want to dig deeper, go into Ezekiel chapter 45. He breaks down into $1,000 increments. The great crowd. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Kelly, I put you to work and you didn't even know it. I love you, baby. <laughs> All right. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped. Saying, go one more thing. Oh, okay. Saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Perfect. Now, I thought it was 144,000. Now, all of a sudden, it's a vast multitude or a crowd that no one could number. Different perspective. Same vision, different perspective now. It's still 144,000, but you're looking at it from another angle, and it's like you cannot imagine how many people are there. So let's talk about this great crowd. Let's talk about this great crowd. What do we know about them? They're from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. Four corners of the earth. They're everywhere. Everyone is represented. They're innumerable. Remember, Revelation is built on symbols and images. Lots of symbolism. 144,000 is not the exact number. We don't know how many is going to be there, but we just know that everyone that is God's chosen people will be there. What are they doing? They're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They're wearing white robes. What does white represent? See if you remember. Purity. They're carrying palm branches in their hands. We'll get to that in a moment. And they're crying out. Now remember, we talked about a few weeks ago, 
Israel cried out. They were crying out because they were being enslaved. They were being tormented. They were being persecuted. They were being tortured by the Egyptians. They were crying out for someone to save them. After they crossed the Red Sea, they start crying out again, but this time in praise. This time in worship to God who delivered them. So when we see this great crowd saying salvation belongs to the Lord, what is the meaning of it? So let's go to a basic question. What does it mean to be saved? What are we saved from? Yeah. Saved from wrath. Whose wrath? God's. God's wrath. What are we saved for? Saved for God's glory. What else are we saved from? Eternal damnation, eternal separation. In the future, what else will we be saved from? Sin, persecution, all these things. In their mind, the first thing that they're thinking about is persecution because remember, this is written to a persecuted churches. Persecuted believers, persecuted followers. So when they see this in the midst of everything that's going on, they see this great crowd that is singing that salvation belongs to you. They see the martyrs that were told to wait. They were in this great crowd. In the midst of all, everything that they were going through. They had to endure. They had to wait until God's appropriate time. And that's how they can say salvation belongs to the Lord and we can say the same thing. Even in the midst of what we're going through, salvation still belongs to the Lord. Deliverance will come and salvation still belongs to the Lord because we will be saved. We will be delivered. If you are in God's chosen community. Everyone understand so far? All right. So now palm branches. We have this is the first time we're really seeing this. And the palm branches. Palm branches represent victory, triumph, joy. Peace. What scriptures do we know of where palm branches were used? Jesus comes riding in on the donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna. Deliverance is coming. Deliverance is here. Joy is coming. Joy is here. Peace is coming. Peace is here. Victory is coming. For them in their mind also, they'd be thinking of the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tents. If you read Zechariah, the end of Zechariah, you'll see this whole thing come to a culmination where everybody, every single one of God's people is waving palm branches in worship to them. We're not going to go into details, so if you want to go deeper, read Leviticus 23 and Zechariah chapter 13, verse 14. Amen. Amen. Not the TV show. <laughs> Amen. Not just something that we say at the end of a prayer. Amen. What does amen even mean? We say it all the time. Do we even know what it means? Let it be so. <laughs> So be it, let it be so, truly, everyone's on one accord. What is in between the amen at the beginning and the amen at the end? What's at the beginning and what's at the end? What's in between those two amens? Hmm? 
Praise. It's got to speak up. I'm old. I can't hear. No, just say praise. Praise the blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to our God forever and ever. Say that last word. No, I know. I just want you to say that last word. Amen. <laughs> How many characteristics are there? <laughs> What's seven? What's seven the number for? Perfection. Perfection, completeness. Amen. Seven blessings, seven attributes. Amen. God is characterized by this completeness. Everything belongs to him. He is completely all these things and then some. There's a lot of sevens when it comes to the book of Revelation. What chapter are we in? <laughs> Seven. Seven. How many seals are there? Seven. What hour of the day is it? 741. How many bowls are there going to be? How many trumpets are there? Seven. Seven is a number that's just repeated. So when we see it, amen. So when we see seven, we have to understand that there is a completeness. Even in the midst of persecution, there is a finality to it. So when the number seven is repeated in the midst of all of this, persecution will end. It will be completed in God's time. We just talked about why it was significant. The redeemed people. Revelation chapter 7, verses 12 through 17. Chris, I got you on this one. And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who was, the midst, who was in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Amen. 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 redeemed people. Where are they coming from? Great tribulation. Great tribulation. Persecution. Death. What did they do? Wash their robes. Made them white. Wash their robes in what? What color is blood? Red represents. See if you remember. Sacrifice. Go ahead. <laughs> blood and sacrifice. What will they receive? The crown. What's the crown represent? Eternal life. Victory, kingship, ruling. Who will be with them? God, Christ. Let's dig a little deeper. Not the lion, but the lamb. lamb. And what's the lamb going to do? Now, doesn't a lamb need a shepherd? The lamb becomes the shepherd. Notice how things are getting flipped. Things are getting flipped here all of a sudden. Let's go back to the one before that. With this lamb shepherding them, what else will they receive? Eternal life. There's a little more. There's some more. Shelter. 
shelter, okay? This is everything they need, the fountain of living water. Everything they need, fountains of living water. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. This remind anybody about some passages? What passages come to mind when you hear these things? Bread of life. Bread of life. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you thou. Go ahead, Miss Wanell. <laughs> Your rod and staff, they comfort me. All come to me who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. There's some more out there. Got a basic one for you. I was the lady at the well. He told her he's going to give her see that living water. Living water. Living water. Mm -hmm. Syrophoenician woman. Think about one of the Psalms. One of the Psalms. Now I'm having a brain fart. Yeah, I can think of it. Hmm? The Lord is my shepherd. Thank you. <laughs> At the beginning. The very, very beginning. Of it. I was in the middle of it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want for what? Anything, because I already have you. You leave me beside still waters. That means, that shows that he's guiding. That shows that he's leading. That shows that he's shepherding. He's caring for us. He leads us. He cares for us. He knows us. He loves us. Those that are in his community, the lamb will shepherd us. Let's talk about what scriptures come to mind. In the head of the game. And Isaiah 25, and I hope Isaiah 35 sounds very familiar. Sounds like that was just preached on. It all comes together. It's all, <laughs> don't mind me. <laughs> all right. The seventh seal. So the end of chapter six, we were in the sixth seal. All of chapter seven, we're still in the sixth seal. Six, does anyone know what six represents? Man, incompleteness, short of perfection, no completeness. When we get to the seventh seal, which is what we are on now, well, let's just go into it. Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Sister Barbara, if you could read that. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal. Oh, Lord. <laughs> there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hands of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumbling, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Sister Barbara. Seventh seal is open. Silence. Everything that needed to be said was said. Everything that needed to be done was done. Silence. Let the earth stand still 
and be silent before the Lord. The time to repent is done. Judgment is now here. But we just opened six seals and now we're at the seventh seal. I thought judgment came already. Think again. This is just the beginning of what's about to take place. When you look at this passage and how we've covered so far from chapter 5 all the way through chapter 7, we were in a throne room and then we saw illusions of a temple. We saw illusions of an altar. We saw illusions of somebody getting worshipped inside the temple. You can see a lot of this here. You have the golden altar. You have the incense that is in the tabernacle, representing the prayers of the people. The only thing that is allowed to go to the presence of God. They're all here to worship, but now judgment comes from the temple as well. When you hear thunders and rumblings and flashes of lightning and earthquake, if you remember back, we kind of talked about that. The Israelites at Mount Sinai. When God was about to speak to his people, you hear the sound of a trumpet. All the people were to gather at the mountain. Then lightning, flashes of light, thunder, rumbling. They saw all that, they were afraid. When judgment comes, I guarantee you, everybody's going to be afraid. Still God. An earthquake. The earth trembles, the earth quakes as Jesus bows his head. Earthquakes represent that something big is about to happen. When you see trumpets, when you see earthquakes, when you see thump, thunders, when you see lightning, something really big is about to happen. Remember we talked about how God created the whole earth. Now we see destruction and judgment getting ready to happen on the earth. God allows this to take place. We saw that all important question that was asked at the end of chapter 6. He said, who can stand? And we see those at 144 who seal the price. That was him. Yeah, I told you. The yeah. second mark of peace. That's right. That's right. Nobody can stand. The ones that are sealed are protected. They are delivered. When we think of a trumpet, this is probably very similar to what John would be looking at. A ram's horn. Trumpets were an announcement and a warning. Joshua, marching around the walls of Jericho, sound the trumpet after they march around. How many times? Seven. Seven. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> Exodus 19:19. 19, 19, as the sound of the ram's horn, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder right as the Israelites are about to come to the mountain. Something big was about to take place. God was about to speak to his people who have been in captivity. When they hear this ram's horn now, when they hear this trumpet now in Revelation, judgment is here. It's a warning and it's an announcement. You're not sealed, you're not protected.
you need to go a little deeper, go into the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 6. So, like I said, there is still hope. It is all alluded to. It is all pictured, all in chapter 7. Chapter 7 is the hope chapter. If you're in Christ. If you're not, the trumpet hasn't sounded yet. So let's reflect. How did you see encouragement for persecuted followers of Christ in chapter 7? Or did you see encouragement for persecuted followers of Christ in chapter 7? I guess it goes back to what you said before, that the 144,000, you don't really know what that number means. But when you had a picture up there with them with the white robes, that means we're included in that as well. Awesome. Awesome. Sun will not smite you, right? Uh, no more hunger, thirst, you know, right away tears. That's an encouragement because they they might have been going through those very things. So there's coming a day when that will all be gone. Mm -hmm. And not just it's done, but you have the glory of being in the presence and shelter of the shelter of the lamb as well. I think one thing that really stood out to me in this chapter is, and I'm going to say this very loosely, we as New Testament believers today don't truly understand persecution, and we mistake privilege for persecution. Loss of privilege is persecution to us. But truly understanding what persecution is, losing your life, for proclaiming the gospel, for staying faithful, for enduring in the midst of somebody taking all of your rights, for being dedicated to Christ. That's persecution. <clears throat> Do we see, or did you see, God revealing his cosmic rule in Revelation chapter 7? See not your head. Most definitely. How'd you see it? Well, um, like the like what we said again and again, Revelation is um, it's the epilogue. It's the um, you know the curtains come down on the devil on those who worship him, um, and we as believers um, we know. We are short of deliverance, you know, we are short, short of salvation, eternal salvation. Um, the book is really interesting because here in chapter seven is the setup for the rest of the book. You know, you get, the, you get the glimpse into really what happened to the evil ones, the ones that, you know, who, you know, who followed the beast, or who was who orchestrated by the dragon, you know. Um, so definitely. I think also how it began, Jay, when you talked about angels going to the corners, they held back the wings of the destruction. Then you pivot to those who have been saved in the midst of holding back the winds, see the ones that are going to come through safely. Uh, his preserving of them and them around the throne. And I kind of forget about the angel holding back. <laughs> Our focus is on the deliverance. Our focus is on the one that is doing all the work. Salvation belongs to our God. So what God is Amen. still and more, nobody can raise our name. The role of Jesus. Did you see the role of Jesus? What is Jesus in this chapter? How do you see Jesus in this chapter? Lamb and the shepherd. Lamb and the shepherd. Do we see a complete defeat of evil in this chapter? Mm -hmm. 
It's holding back. Right. It's implied. Remember, this is hope. I see you who hasn't been successful. It looks successful, but it's not. And lastly, do we see God's kingdom fully revealed? Not fully. There's allusions to it because you do get a glimpse. Great crowd that is worshiping all day. How many attributes between amens? Seven. Completeness. Nobody is missing. <laughs> That's right. Preparation for next week. Final week. Pray. Please don't kill me, y'all. I had to ask my wife about this one. And she gave me she gave me this answer. I think I put it right. <laughs> Review Revelation chapter one through chapter eight, verse five. Really, really? <laughs> Here it is. You can use sermons, you can use your notes, you can use the home study guides, you can use Bible study. Just a basic review. Especially the sermons. Especially the sermons. And then lastly, read Revelation. It's only seven verses. Chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. And next week, I'm going to give you a different picture to look at. We're going to think in pictures next week. So it's going to be a little different. All right, that is it for tonight. Any questions, concerns, confusion? I don't want to I want to make sure that no one is confused. All right. Well, let's close out with a word of prayer. <clears throat> and then we will do our prayer request. Now. All right. All hearts and minds. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your word, uh, your word which brings life, your word that brings hope, uh, your word that brings deliverance, your word that reveals Jesus, how you and he are the authors and finishers of our faith, our protectors, our shepherds. We ask that you continue to guide us in your word, help us to understand your word, how it applies to us even more, and how we have deliverance only through you. How you already said that you will never leave us or forsake us how you will help us to endure in the midst of persecution. We ask that you just be with those that were here, with those that were unable to be here, be with those that were online as well. Uh, we know that you are all encompassing. You are sovereign. You are the one that sits on the throne. Nothing catches you by surprise. And we thank you for that. And as your word says, praise and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power, and strength belong to you forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Any prayer requests?